Hello again, everyone. Welcome back to Timeless Testimonies. Today we're going to finish up the first testimony found in Volume 5 of Testimonies for the Church by Ellen White. It's called Camp Meeting Address. And we're in this last section where it has a subheading titled Responsibility of Ministers. And I'm going to do a quick review, but before I do, I want to read the next section, you know, where we left off beginning into the next section, I want to read that to explain why I'm going to be focusing on the parts of the testimony in my review that I will be focusing on. But before I even do that, I just want to remind us all of why the testimonies are so important. They actually help to correct our errors in thinking, in behavior, and all of that. They help us to learn principles which should govern the life, should govern our our uh, actions and our choices from day to day. And we discussed how having a love for the testimonies can actually hasten Christ's return because we're told in Second Peter and in Ellen White's writings that what Christ is waiting for in order to come back to claim us as his own is for his people to have his character perfectly reproduced in them. So to apply that to us as an individual, what Christ is waiting for and longing for is for each one of us to perfectly have his character reproduced in our lives. And in order to be able to have his character reproduced in our lives, we need to know what his character was like. So studying the life of Christ, studying the life of Jesus is such an important thing for us to be doing as followers of Christ. And then to not water it down or anything like that, not to give ourselves special privileges or some kind of leeway to not match that mark, not to reach that bar that he set for us in how we should live. Christ lived a sinless life. And we are promised that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us, that he left us his life as an example for us to follow that example. So please keep that in mind as we go through the testimonies for the church so that we can do our part in hastening his return and just putting an end to all of sin and suffering, immorality and unlovingness and all of that. So let's dive right into it now, shall we? Let none entertain the thought that I regret or take back any plain testimony I have borne to individuals or to the people. Okay, so what kind of testimonies, what kind of straight testimony and rebukes is she talking about? Well, let's just go back and review. So if we go back to the beginning, here's a few things that she has to say throughout the testimony. Great light has been given you, and few have responded to it. So there's a rebuke. Few have responded to the great light. And keep in mind, we always want to be self-examining when we go through these testimonies. We don't want to get caught up in, oh yeah, what they did was bad, right? That's not going to help anyone. They're long gone. You're not going to be able to have any effect on their choices. Even if they were still alive, everyone is free to make their own choices. And it doesn't help anybody's circumstance to just be looking at someone else's faults. So let's internalize these things and say, okay, well, have I had great light? What have I done with it? How have I responded to it? Okay, so right off the bat, her first rebuke in this testimony is that great light has been given you and few have responded to it. But I love how God's rebukes are always tempered with some amount of love and encouragement because she continues to say, yet my heart goes out in tender solicitude for our beloved people in Michigan. And see our earlier videos on a more detailed treating of this portion of the testimony. Another rebuke that she gives. There will be faithful ones who will discern the signs of the times, so tempered with some encouragement and hope, right? While a large number professing present truth will deny their faith, so that's not good. 
So while a large number will deny their faith by their works, there will be some who will endure unto at the end. So even though there's encouragement there, there will be some who will endure to the end. It's obviously a rebuke because the larger number of professed followers of Christ will deny their faith by their works. She goes on to say, many who profess to be children of God follow their worldly pursuits with an intensity that gives the lie to their profession. Where do we fall in that? Do we give lie to our profession to be followers of Christ by following our worldly pursuits and doing so with an intensity what kind of worldly pursuits might we be pursuing that would show that we give lie to the profession that we are following Christ? Is there anything that we do that persuades us to compromise right principles? That's one way that we could be following worldly pursuits with an intensity that gives lie to our profession. Another example that I could think of is something that may be perfectly fine as a profession, and yet we are so intent upon it for whatever reason, maybe financial gain, temporal security, I don't know. There could be a number of different things that could play a part, but do we allow even a good profession, a moral profession, to so engage our time and attention that we neglect those who may be right in front of us, maybe even our own family, our own household, that we neglect their needs for our uh, personal presence, our um, mental engagement, our interaction. There's just so many things that it could be, you know, that would fit this principle here. So I just wanted to offer a couple examples that came to my mind. Um, if it might be helpful in the whole process of self-examination. Let's continue on uh, refreshing our memories as to what were some of the rebukes and um, plain testimonies that Ellen White gave that she says she doesn't take any of it back. Those who have had the light of present truth and yet feel no spirit of labor to warn their fellow men of the coming judgment must give an account to God for their neglect of duty. The blood of souls will be upon their garments. Now she's referring to the passage in Ezekiel where he's told he's a watchman and that he has been commissioned to warn God's people like the watchman would do. They'd be up on the wall and they'd be looking out to see if there's any impending danger. And if they didn't warn the people within the walls of the city and danger came and overtook them, well, who would be responsible? Those who had the duty to watch out for the danger and sound warning in the first place, right? It's very um, practical. It has a lot of common sense to that. So we've all been called to be watchmen. We've been called to be co-laborers with Christ. And so if we see danger, and clearly Ellen White was called to be a watchman in a very specific way, she was called to be a mouthpiece for God, a prophet just means a spokesperson or a mouthpiece for God. And she was called in a way unlike the other members of the body of Christ to give reproof and counsel and warning directly from God. And so we all have our individual duty to a degree, but some people have a difference in the degree to which they're called to be watchmen and, and what that really means, what sounding the warning looks like. It doesn't always mean that you go up to someone and you say, you know, here's a specific sin I see in your life that you shouldn't be doing. You know, Ellen White was called to do that sort of thing, but not necessarily everyone is called to do that. 
However, we can always be drawing people's minds to an awareness and a better understanding of the principles of truth that should govern our lives. Okay, so she continues on with some of her uh, rebukes by saying, we are not doing one twentieth part of what God requires us to do. So think about that, you know, examine your own life in regard to that. Only you can. Are you, and just be sure that you be honest with yourself though, right? Because we can tend to um, not do that. I mean, very simply put, we can tend to be dishonest with our own selves. And that's why um, God has repeatedly said through the counsel of Ellen White that we don't really know ourselves. I have a video going through that. I hope you'll check that out. I think it's really beneficial to bring to light for our own self-awareness. We might not know ourselves as good as we think we do. And that can really bring us to a state of humble submission to be teachable, even to learn about our own character. All right. so. Moving on, Ellen White has more to say. Um, let's see. Let's do this one. She wrote, this is on page 15. She wrote, it is only to those who are waiting in hope and faith that Christ will appear without sin unto salvation. Many have the theory of the truth who know not the power of godliness. If the word of God dwelt in the heart, it would control the life. Faith, purity, and conformity to the will of God would testify to its sanctifying power. So these are some of the things that Ellen White had to say in this testimony. Now I'll read just a couple more. Who of us is faithfully following the pattern? Who of us has instituted and continued the warfare against pride of heart? Who of us has, in good earnest, brought himself to wrestle with selfishness until it should no longer dwell in the heart and be revealed in the life? Those are great questions. Great self-examination questions to consider. And even though that's not like the most stereotypical way of rebuking someone. Sometimes those questions asked when we know the truth of the answer can be very, very convicting and are in essence a rebuke and a correction. I have been shown that as a people, we are departing from the simplicity of the faith and from the purity of the gospel. Many are in great peril. Unless they change their course, they will be severed from the true vine as useless branches. Again, that's a rebuke because if we are not truly connected to the vine, if we have not partaken of that life that the vine provides, that life of Christ, study his life, what was his life like? That's the life we're talking about. If we do not do that, if we are not connected to that living vine, we will be severed as useless branches. How much of the work which the master has left for us to do has been left undone. All around us are souls to be warned. But how often has the time been occupied in self-serving and the record gone up to God of souls passing to their graves unwarned and unsaved? That is a heavy rebuke. Really consider that. How much of the work which the master has left for you to do has been left undone. Like I have to ask that question of myself too. And I know that I have a lot to answer for. And I don't want that to be the case anymore, ever again. I want to be devoting my time and energies to trying to help people learn 
the principles of truth that can bring freedom from the guilt and bondage of immorality or sin as we typically refer to it. These things need to be dwelt upon. They need to be presented before the people. They need to be explained in ways that make an impact in our lives. And I have to answer that question for my own self and so do you. So how much of the work that the master has given you to do has been done or not done? How much have you left undone? Now let's continue to read the last paragraph that we finished with in our previous video before continuing on with the new content. The Lord still has purposes of mercy toward us. There is room for repentance. We may become the beloved of God. I entreat you who have put far off the appearing of our Lord, commence now the work of redeeming the time. Study the word of God. Let all at this meeting make a covenant with God to put away light and trifling conversation and frivolous, unimportant reading. And for the coming year, diligently and prayerfully study the Bible that you may be able to give to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is within you with meekness and fear. Will you not without delay humble your hearts before God and repent of your backslidings? So that's where we left off last time. And I just love this paragraph because it's so inclusive. Like it has that encouragement and that love. You can just hear the intensity of the love in the rebuke given, right? But at the same time, it is really very convicting. It is reproving the lack of activity that many people are guilty of. And specifically the group that she was writing to, those who were to assemble at the Michigan camp meeting, where it was supposed to have been read, I'll just remind you, it wasn't read at the camp meeting, it was forgotten. And it was read later at a general conference meeting. But that even really is very telling to the state of things then. And we have to ask, is it the state of things now? How neglected are the testimonies for the church in your life? Do you make them a priority? Do you seek counsel about how to live a moral life? by going to inspiration and seeing what did God have to say to people back then. These are written down and preserved for our benefit. They're not just a one-time delivery for a person or group of people 150, 170 years ago. They've been recorded so that people throughout the ages can benefit. Please see my series on the nature and influence of the testimonies for a fuller treating of all of that that I've just discussed. Now, I just love how one of the things that is being um, put forward as a plea for us to do is to study the Word of God for the purpose of having such a thorough, understanding of the reasons for our faith that we will be able to share those reasons with others. We need to be able to do that if only to help someone else better understand things for themselves as well. But there's also going to be times coming and maybe some have even already been faced with this sort of situation where we're going to have to um, defend our actions before even lawmakers. So we need to know now the reasons for our faith. We need to be able to explain to someone why we believe what we believe. We can't just say, you know, well, I can believe what I want to believe and you're free to believe what you want to believe. Truth is truth. Something is either real or it's imaginary. And if something is true, then we need to understand why it's true. We can't just 
arbitrarily claim something to be true. We need to have reasons for our faith. And I love the passage where Ellen White says that God never requires anyone to believe without sufficient evidence upon which to base our faith. I just absolutely love that. God is not a dictator. He's not arbitrary. He gives us reasons for our faith and even goes further to want us to only believe something if we have sufficient evidence to have that belief or to believe those things. So let's continue now with the rest of the testimony. Let none entertain the thought that I regret or take back any plain testimony I have borne to individuals or to the people. If I have erred anywhere, it is in not rebuking sin more decidedly and firmly. Some of the brethren have taken the responsibility of criticizing my work and proposing an easier way to correct wrongs. To these persons, I would say, I take God's way and not yours. What I have said or written in testimony or reproof has not been too plainly expressed. This is really interesting to me because what this shows to me is that people really, you know, we, what we really tend to do is we tend to think that we know better than someone else, even God's own messenger. This should be a warning to us. We should really look at this and say, okay, now, do I really believe that Ellen White had an inspired message from God? And honestly, you should only believe it if you've tested the message. If you haven't tested the message and you come into trial, you'll probably deny your faith in the long run anyway. So it really doesn't benefit anyone for you to profess to believe something that when times get really hard and you're tested and tried, that you're going to back away and say, oh, you know what? No, actually she was a false prophet. I don't believe that message after all. Find out whether or not you believe it. Have good reasons for your faith, but don't take the lazy way and say, oh, you know what? Yeah, I've never really tested whether or not Ella White was a true prophet. So I guess I just don't know if she was a true prophet or not. So I guess she was a false prophet and I just shouldn't believe what she said. Think about that for a little while and recognize how illogical that is. All that is doing is recognizing, oh, I didn't really know what I thought I knew but then taking an irrational approach and say, I guess that means that what I thought I knew was false. That's not what it means. It just means that you don't know whether it's true or false. To then say, oh, I know that it's false is to commit the same logical fallacy. And I forget maybe what the name of the logical fallacy is, maybe a false dichotomy. Um, anyway, to say, if I don't know that this is true, well, then it means it's false. No, what it means is you don't know. And that's all you can say is you don't know. And should that be where you remain? Should you remain in a place where you don't know? That's not a safe place to be, right? That's kind of a scary place to be where you don't know what's true or false. So how do you know if you're doing what's right? Get to the bottom of it. Don't be lazy. Get to the bottom of it, test it, search out the matter, find out the truth of it, and then fully embrace what you've been able to verify to be true. If you can verify something to be false, well then yes, then you should take the position that it's false if you really know that something's false. But again, you have to really understand this point. It's a very important point. If you don't know whether something's true or false, you have no justification for taking either position. The only position you're justified in taking is one of uncertainty that you just don't know. But then again, I have to stress, don't stay there. Don't be lazy. Make the effort to find out the truth. So continuing on. 
God has given me my work, and I must meet it at the judgment. Those who have chosen their own way, who have risen up against the plain testimonies given them, and have sought to shake the faith of others in them, must settle the matter with God. I take back nothing. I soften nothing to suit their ideas or to excuse their defects of character. I have not spoken as plainly as the case required. Those who would in any way lessen the force of the sharp reproofs which God has given me to speak must meet their work at the judgment. So Ellen White has her own work to meet at the judgment and other people have their own work to meet at the judgment too. We will be judged for our own actions. Within a few weeks past, standing face to face with death, I have had a near look into eternity. If the Lord is pleased to raise me from my present state of feebleness, I hope in the grace and strength that comes from above to speak with fidelity the words which he gives me to speak. All through my life, it has been terribly hard for me to hurt the feelings of any or disturb their self-deception as I deliver the testimonies given me of God. It is contrary to my nature it costs me great pain and many sleepless nights. To those who have taken the responsibility to reprove me and, in their finite judgment, to propose a way which appears wiser to them, I repeat, I do not accept your efforts. Leave me with God and let him teach me. I will take the words from the Lord and speak them to the people. I do not expect that all will accept the reproof and reform their lives, but I must discharge my duty all the same. I will walk in humility before God, doing my work for time and for eternity. She's just describing here that part of her mission, part of her job description, if you will, as God's messenger is to bring reproof cutting and severe as it may be, to the erring people of God. God inspired the revelator to say that all whom God loves, he rebukes and chastens, right? So if you see someone on the path to destruction, the only loving thing to do would be to correct them. And sometimes that has to be really startling. You know, it's tough to face the realization sometimes that you were wrong when you think you're right. But if you actually are wrong and you learn that, it goes against the carnal nature, but the only right thing to do is to honestly be happy to learn that you were wrong because that means that you're learning the truth. God has not given my brethren the work that he has given me. It has been urged that my manner of giving reproof in public has led others to be sharp and critical and severe. If so, they must settle that matter with the Lord. If others take a responsibility which God has not laid upon them, if they disregard the instructions he has given them again and again through the humble instrument of his choice to be kind, patient, and forbearing, they alone must answer for the results. Basically, all Ellen White is saying here is that she was given the duty to bring these inspired counsels of reproof and rebuke. That's not something that everyone was called to do. And yet there were people doing just that very thing and claiming that they were following Ellen White's example or something like that. And that isn't the counsel that she had given. And she says so here that they disregarded the instructions. You know, if they choose to disregard the instructions, what were the instructions? The instructions were to be kind, patient, and forbearing. And if they choose to disregard those instructions and come across as unkind, impatient, and overbearing, 
when they're trying to correct someone's wrongs or what they perceive to be a wrong in someone, then they're going to have to answer for the results. And she's counseling against people doing that, obviously. With a sorrow burdened heart, I have performed my unpleasant duty to my dearest friends, not daring to please myself by withholding reproof, even from my husband. And I shall not be less faithful in warning others whether they will hear or forbear. Just think about that. Like, it really is a very unpleasant thing to have to point out to someone they're wrong. And especially if it's someone that you're close with, that you have a close relationship with, they're your dearest friends or your closest family member, your spouse or, you know, your parent. You know, it's more common for a parent to counsel or reprove or correct their child. That's, you know, an easier one to imagine doing and not feeling um, really unpleasant about it. It's just kind of the more automatic, natural thing. But man, Ellen White had to bring pretty straight testimony to people that she had close relationships with. And, you know, sometimes when people are corrected, they don't like it to the point where they're not going to have a relationship with you anymore. And that's a scary thing that can deter people from giving correction in the first place. And that was a temptation for Ellen. She writes about it early on in the testimonies, volume one or two, I think volume one. But that is something that early on God had to show her, you can't indulge yourself in that type of withholding of reproof because I have set you to be a watchman and you are to sound the note of warning. You need to help these people to be saved from the destruction of sin and immorality. So she's saying, look, guys, I have to do this sort of thing, even with my dearest friends. And I haven't even withheld reproof for my own husband. I'm certainly not going to withhold reproof from the general population of the body of Christ. You know, this is an important duty and it has to be done, even though it's unpleasant for me. When I am speaking to the people, I say much that I have not premeditated. The spirit of the Lord frequently comes upon me. I seem to be carried out of and away from myself. The life and character of different persons are clearly presented before my mind. I see their errors and dangers and feel compelled to speak of what is thus brought before me. I dare not resist the Spirit of God. I know that some are displeased with my testimony. It does not suit their proud, unconsecrated hearts. I feel more and more deeply the loss which our people have sustained by their failure to accept and obey the light which God has given them. Let's pause. How does this apply to us? Have we accepted and obeyed the light we have been given? Are you even fully aware of all the light that you've been given? There's a whole bunch in the testimonies for the church. It's not the only place where it's given, but since, you know, this is all about the testimonies for the church, and since they're such a wonderful source to obtain that light and information, like why not consider that? Have you read the testimonies for the church? Have you read them with an intense desire to learn the truth about yourself? If not, how, you know, how can you say that you have benefited or that you even know what the light is that has been given to you? You know, we need to accept that light. If you don't know what it is, how can you accept it? We need to obey that light. If you don't know what it is, how are you obeying it with any kind of knowledge? You know, how would you even be able to obey something that you don't know? So these are things that as we contemplate them and then really implement them, let them change the way we behave and think that we will be transformed 
into the likeness of Christ, that we will have his mind in us that we have been counseled to have. And we can, by doing these things, by having a love for the testimonies, by loving correction, we can literally hasten Christ's return and hasten the end of sin and suffering. My younger brethren in the ministry, I entreat you to reflect more upon your solemn responsibility. If consecrated to God, you may exert a powerful influence for good in the church and the world, but you lack heartfelt piety and devotion. God has sent you to be a light to the world by your good works as well as by your words and theories. But many of you may truly be represented by the foolish virgins who had no oil in their lamps. Can it be said of us that we could be represented by those foolish virgins who had no oil in their lamps? Are you imparting light to others? Do you have that oil of grace, that gift of the Holy Spirit that imparts knowledge of truth? and right principles, are you fueled with that oil that enables the flame to exist in the first place? Are you taking in that oil, continually supplying the reserve that it can be burned? You know, when you're giving light, you're burning up oil. You are using it you are, in essence, depleting your reserve, which is why it's important to have extra oil in your vessels with your lamps, because in order to give light, you have to use up the oil. And you need to be constantly giving light, which means you need to be constantly taking in that oil. You need to be constantly learning of the Holy Spirit. You need to be constantly learning the principles of truth and implementing that. So we are to be a light to the world by our good works, not just with a theory of the truth. We have to live it out. My brethren, heed the reproof and counsel of the true witness, and God will work for you and with you. That is such a beautiful promise. Heed the counsel, and God will work with you and for you. Your enemies may be strong and determined, but one mightier than they will be your helper. Let the light shine and it will do its work. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Man, that is so inspiring. It's so encouraging. It's so motivating. Please, I urge you to. Be eager to be saved. Be eager to demonstrate to others the light of Christ, the light of truth. Be eager to impart that knowledge of truth and love and righteousness and live out the truth in your life. Be a true light and don't forget to keep replenishing your stores of oil. And continue to investigate the testimonies for the church. Thank you so much for doing so, and may you all be blessed. Shalom.